quickly on signing statements. How dare the president issue a statement saying he's not going to be bound by some provision of a law? The reality is this doctrine goes back at least to George Washington, I'm sorry, at least to, to Tom Jefferson. Uh, and again, this is the point on hierarchy of laws. Uh, Tom Jefferson, as soon as he took power, said, I'm not going to enforce the Alien and Sedition Laws because they violate the First Amendment. He instructed the U.S. attorneys to stop all prosecutions. He, he asked that all the fines be refunded to the critics of the government who had been imprisoned or fined. Uh, he didn't issue a signing statement because Adams had already signed the law, but it's the same principle. I will not be bound by an unconstitutional law. John Marshall in Marbury said an act of the legislature repugnant to the Constitution is void. It is not law. Not being law, it is not among those things the president has a duty to see faithfully executed. The president is not saying I'm the last word. He's saying until the Supreme Court resolves this, my belief is that this is unconstitutional. I have to hold it constant. This gives us a case of controversy where we might get a decision by the court. The Lovett case in 1942, a right-wing Southern Appropriations Committee subcommittee chairman uh, put a rider on a, an unvetoable bill, an emergency bill to support the war, World War II, uh, saying no money could be used to pay the salaries of three named individuals who were known to be subversives, according to the House Committee of Un-American Activities. President Roosevelt issued a signing statement saying that language will not bind the executive or the judiciary. In 1946, the Supreme Court held this was a uh, bill of attainder. Now, some signing statements are absolutely beyond challenge. Uh, the most frequent use of signing statements, back in 1976, when I was a Senate staffer, I wrote a long statement that got put in the congressional record as a speech, even though it had 20-some-odd footnotes, saying legislative vetoes are unconstitutional. In 1983, uh, uh, the Supreme Court agreed with that and declared they are unconstitutional. Rather than removing them from the statute books since 1983, the, the United States Congress has enacted more than 500 legislative vetoes. And each time they do it, be it President Reagan or President Clinton or President Bush, either one, presidents issue signing statements saying this is unconstitutional, it will not bind us. Now Bush has made many mistakes. One of the classic examples, one of the exceptions given to the president under Article 1, Section 8, or sorry, given to Congress under Article 1, Section 8, is the power to define and punish offenses against the law of nations. Clearly, Congress can pass laws criminalizing violations of the CAT, violations of the, of the Geneva Conventions. They're wrong on that. But the basic principle that the Constitution gives the president certain unchecked powers has been understood from the earliest days of this country. Uh, in our frustration over some of the excesses, and they certainly have been excesses by both branches, uh, let us not lose sight of the reality that the, we did create a unitary executive, uh, and uh, you know that's the Constitution that we need to live under. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we have witnessed a historic occasion. We have brought Bob Turner in in 15 minutes for probably the first time in, in recent memory. And I've never been involved in a panel presentation in which Bob hasn't invoked the name of Tom Jefferson at least once uh, at his association with the University of Virginia. Uh, our next speaker will be Professor Sean Watts from Creighton. Thank you, Mr. Graham. Uh, thank you also to Dean Romig and to the uh, Washburn Law Journal staff uh, for putting together this really I'd just like to say thanks. Is this on? This was fine. Okay. Well, uh, those were just thank yous uh, to begin with. Not just thank yous. They were, they were heartfelt thank yous. Uh, first to, uh, to Dean Romig for putting the event together, as well as uh, thanks to his, uh, his Law Review staff. This is an impressive event, and I'm, I'm very pleased to be a part of it. Uh, I was happy to see um, Mr. Graham uh, sketch out a couple of the uh, bases for the unitary executive theory. What I'd like to do is just to go through some of these bases very quickly uh, and then to focus on a, a final one and to perhaps um, try out some examples of how that basis was either vindicated by the Bush administration or perhaps not. Um, so Mr. Graham mentioned that text, structure, and history of the Constitution were bases put forward by unitary executive theorists at the beginning of the global war on terror. Um, I'll just start with that first one, with text. Um, 
Unitary executive theorists would generally have you read Article 2 of the Constitution differently. The, the crux of unitary executive theory is this understanding that when they drafted Article 2 of the Constitution, that the founders had something very different in mind, and that it's evidenced by this very ambiguous language. If you are familiar with Article 1 and how it enumerates power to the legislative branch, you know that there's a quite exhaustive list of the ends that Congress can legitimately pursue under the Constitution. By comparison, Article 2 uh, is very scant. There are not uh, lists of enumerated powers. There is instead, according to unitary executive theorists, this idea that the vesting clause is a major source of authority. Often, uh, unitary executive theorists will draw your attention to a comparison between the vesting clause of Article 1 and the vesting clause of Article 2. Where Article 1 vests power in a Congress through the powers herein granted, the, the clause actually says the legislative powers herein granted are vested in a Congress, Article 2 of the Constitution says the executive power is, is vested in a President of the United States. There is no herein granted language there. Unitary executive theorists make quite a lot of this and say this is the reason that Article 2 has to be understood differently, that there are implied powers. Rather than spell out exactly what we wanted our executive to do, uh, we knew when we drafted the Constitution that executive power had certain meanings. Uh, Professor Turner shared uh, with us thoughts that perhaps Locke and Montesquieu had clear ideas of what executive power were, and that this is a strong argument for why we not, we ought not to hold the president's feet to the fire uh, as we would the Congress uh, for sources of enumerated power under the Constitution. Now, that's not so problematic um, to, to make this argument about implied power, but what unified or unitary executive theory couples with these implied powers is that they are intended not only to be implied or, or inherent in the executive, but that they're, they're also plenary that they are not shared with other branches of the government. And I would submit that this is a difficulty, a difficulty that, that's highlighted on at least one of Professor Turner's slides, um, that actually when Article 1 enumerates some of these powers, a few of these implied or inherent powers that are claimed by unitary executive theorists can actually be found in Article 1 of the Constitution. Professor Turner shared the, uh, the power to define offenses or to punish offenses under the law of nations. That power belongs to Congress. Uh, and so it places unitary executive theorists in a difficult position sometimes. Some of the other difficulties with these textual bases are their indeterminacy. Uh, this ambiguous language obviously gives rise to a number of interpretations. And as early as 1794, we found the executive theory amongst itself debating the meaning of, the, uh, of, of its power under Article II in the neutrality controversy. Uh, this pitted Hamilton uh, against Madison, who was by most accounts egged on by Jefferson, uh, to write a series of debates about the nature of executive power. So we can see very early on there was at least disagreement. There was a, a level of indeterminacy in this text in Article 1 that's so critical to unitary executive theory.